I would like to invite to the stage Professor Max Welling, ladies and gentlemen. Um, Max, what, what are going to be the key takeaways for the audience, you think, of your talk? So well, um, the first one is that um, machine learning and AI is on a roller coaster, so it's, uh, it's going, going very fast. It's right? going very fast, and uh, very good, many good things can happen because of it, like we can revolutionize healthcare. Um, on the other hand, there's also a lot of worries coming with this in terms of privacy and in terms of maybe even robots taking over the world. Um, and I think we should, uh, well, we don't have to worry about robots taking over the world for a long, long time, but we should definitely address problems which have to do with privacy and fairness and such. Okay, thank you very much. Looking forward to your talk. Thank you so much. I also thank you, want to thank uh, Tex Kernel for inviting me here. It's an honor for me to be here and talk to you about machine learning. So my talk is about uh, not necessarily directly about recruiting, um, although there is definitely connections to it, and I'll try to make a few, um, but it's mostly about the new and latest developments in uh, machine learning, which is the, my field of interest and my field of research. Um, of course. Ah. Uh, so the overview is, I'm going to first talk a little bit about uh, deep learning, which is this new technology, which is uh, currently uh, in the news a lot, and it's very promising. I'm going to talk about causality research, about reinforcement learning, privacy. I'll show a few examples of AI and success stories, and I'll conclude. It seems it's a bit sluggish. Right, OK. Um, so um, just to, to get the setting, um, you know, we all know what computer science is, right? This is the science about computers and, uh, and coding, um, and then inside that uh, there is data science. It's actually not quite inside. There's also other related fields which do data science, like econometrics and mathematics. Um, and then within that, we have artificial intelligence, um, which is the, the part of computer science that wants to make machines smart. Um, and these days, it's mostly with the help of data. And then within, in, within that, there's machine learning. And machine learning is a, is a branch of AI which wants to make computers smart by having them learn from data. And then finally, within machine learning, one tool in the machine learner's toolbox is called deep learning. And deep learning is basically a neural-inspired or brain-inspired um, uh, tools for classification and other uh, applications. Um, so why do we see this sort of uh, growth and in interest in machine learning? And why do we see all these successful applications? There's basically three important uh, ingredients. Um, one is uh, Moore's Law, which has been going on already at least starting in the 70s, which is computer power doubles every two years. Um, that has fed into a new growth law, which is the law of exponential growth of data. Also around every one to two years, we see a doubling of the amount of data that's around due to the uh, censoring of the, of, uh, the world. And then together, they feed into this tool, which is, for instance, deep learning, but in general, uh, machine learning, which are really large models with uh, now billions of parameters, which are all being tuned based on that data and using all that computer power. So there's three types of machine learning. Well, there's more, but these are, this is sort of the most uh, sort of broad categorization of those. Uh, the first one is uh, supervised learning. And in supervised learning, we have labeled examples available. This is like a young child walking, uh, trying to learn about the world, and the uh, mother or father is always there to point out that, you know, that's a monitor, and that's a chair, you know, and that's a ball, right? And so the child actually receives these labels uh, concerning the things that uh, he or she observes in the world. Now, unsupervised learning is more like a child that is just sitting somewhere and observing the world and trying to make sense of it. Right? It, you know, uh, the child will see certain objects reappear many times and say, well, that's probably a category. That's probably a, a type of thing that, see, that keeps reappearing and that it should give some kind of name. And then finally, which is the most comprehensive framework, which is reinforcement learning, which is like children which learn from actually acting in the world. So in other words, uh, it's a child that's running around in the world and that pushes you know, his brother over, and then the brother you know, fights back. And in, in that interaction, you know, the, the child has learned a lot about how the world works and that you shouldn't push your brother over. 
Now, what I view as four really important new developments that are currently at the cusp of really becoming you know, really important. Uh, well, the first one, deep learning, is already really breaking through and, and, and making a, a really big impact, um, which is a tool that's basically being applied to high sampling rate signals. With this, I mean speech or images or even language at this point. Um, the, the next one is causal discovery. This is if we are reasoning, you know, if we're trying to find variables which are predictive of something, you know, are they actually, is one the cause of the other? So I'll give you an example. Um, in the news recently, we have seen that black cars um, are correlated with more accidents, right? And actually, your insurance fee has gone up because of this mere fact. But that's a correlation, because the blackness of the car does not cause the accident, right? This is more like the testosterone level of the driver that's in the car that's causing the accident. And then, as already said, uh, reinforcement learning is this tool where we, it's basically for robotics. Uh, it's learning from interacting with the world and from the rewards that the world will give us back. Um, and, you know, it, the clear example is robotics, but interestingly for this audience, recommender systems and search engines are actually also examples of this more general framework where we feed information to the world, which is a user, which will then give us feedback, uh, give us uh, information back, um, uh, which things the user, for instance, likes. And then the final thing I want to talk about briefly is privacy-preserving machine learning. Data is really the oil of our modern economy, and increasingly so, but it also comes with, uh, with, um, with problems. Uh, for instance, if we censor an entire city, which we call a smart city, we can now track every individual in, in this city, and this is really something that we want. And can we still do machine learning, but still guarantee the privacy of every individual? Um, so I'm going to briefly talk now about this tool, which is called deep learning which is a, a, we call a neural net, which is uh, something where we provide input. Here could be an image, for instance, or this could be a, a CV or resume from somebody. And we try to predict something. Maybe we want to predict whether this particular person is a good match for this particular job. Um, and it's inspired by basically how the brain uh, works, which is it has lots of connections, which are called synapses in the brain. And it has these units, which are called neurons in the brain. And each neuron interacts with all the neurons around it. And together, they produce some kind of output. Now, this is the Google, brain, the Google uh, neural net. It had uh, billions of parameters. And it sort of automatically discovered things like cats and faces, because it was trained on images and videos, which had a lot of faces and cats in it. Um, so this is the most uh, important version of a neural net, uh, which we call a convolutional neural net. Um, in a convolutional neural net, we, uh, we analyze images and speech. Um, and here you can see something important, what's happening. As you go deeper and deeper into the layers of the neural net, these neurons become sensitive to increasingly abstract concepts. The first layers are interested in simple things like edges. Where are the edges in the image? But as you go deeper, it looks to, it is going to look for eyes and noses, and in, in the end, even entire faces, and maybe even like your grandmother's face, um, and just only your grandmother's face. So it becomes invariant to certain uh, you know, lighting conditions and orientations, but very specific in terms of what it likes to detect. Now here you can see a little bit of how fast the improvements have been going in this contest, which is called a uh, the um, ImageNet challenge, and it's basically uh, a couple of million images and a couple of thousand categories that need to be detected in these images. So you have an image, and it's like there's a person in it, there's a chair in it, you know, there's a scissors in it, etc. And you need to predict which what stuff is in the image. We're incredibly good at this. We have a very, you know, uh, high accuracy on this. But when we started to do this in the 2000, you know, 2010, we had a very high error rate, and then it has been slowly going down over the years. And right now, in 2015, the Microsoft ResNet architecture basically achieved human performance. And this is very, very, you know, gone in a few years. And you, what you see is that, you know, here, the appearance of deep neural networks uh, for the first time uh, started to compete. And, um, and the number of layers and the depth of these neural networks have been growing increasingly. And the deeper the neural net, the latest one had 152 layers, the better the performance of these networks. 
Um, this is human performance, but it has different error types. It can distinguish between 12 types of dogs, which look incredibly dissimilar to us, but it also makes ridiculous mistakes where we say, well, that's clearly obvious. So there's still some uh, improvements to make. And this is the actual neural net with 152 layers visualized, which was the latest winner. So it's, uh, it's um, getting deeper and deeper, these networks. Now here we see how uh, such a network w works if you apply it to an image. So here's a, a wolf or a frog, and he, it creates all these feature maps. This is basically, it analyzes the image in different ways, and it creates all these features about the image completely automatically, and in the end it then classifies uh, the, the image as being a, a, a wolf or a frog. Um, and it's the, the important difference with normal machine learning is that in normal machine learning, we actually choose the features ourselves. So here the idea is that we feed the raw input image and learn the features from the data directly. Here's an example of uh, a startup company, uh, actually, that I'm involved in, Cypher, um, where we get 3D CT scans um, of uh, bone. It's hip bone and femur bone. And the algorithm needs to segment out where the bone is and needs to classify whether it's femur bone or hip bone. And you see that it's uh, doing a pretty decent job. Here's an application for um, detecting errors on steel, which is uh, something that Tata Steel is very interested in. So uh, the old hoog ovens, for those uh, Dutch people here who know about them. So uh, there is a large amount of steel that run through uh, a system. And it's uh, it, it, like cameras are watching it. And you need to figure out where there are these bad defects, scratches, um, uh, which might be so bad, in fact, that they destroy the machine uh, down the line, so you have to stop the production line, or maybe less critical ones. So you need to segment out the error, the defect, and you need to classify it in one, over, uh, one in, of 23 different defects. So again, deep learning is really, really good at this. Here's a really fun application where um, this is a group from, uh, from uh, Tübingen. So they take a picture, a photo, and then you can choose your own favorite painter. And then you extract from these two, uh, from this you extract the style. Again, a deep learning algorithm is extracting the style information. And uh, another, another uh, uh, sort of uh, extractor uses, looks at the content of the image. And then these two gets combined into a new image which has the content of the photo, but the style of the painter. And this is pretty, pretty amazing. So here's the original image. Now here's the Van Gogh version of this image. So you see it's quite artistic, right? It's, it's actually you know, quite happy to make these lines not straight, but a little bit uh, you know, curved. And it, it, it's sort of really painting on this canvas. Now here's another one. I'm not sure you know, if you recognize the painter. Um, here's another one. This is a monk. And if you look well, you see the screamer right there. Here is one that's sort of a, a painting of the, of, with the sea composed on it. And this is a Kandinsky, if you had noticed. Clearly, Kandinsky is very abstract, so the content has uh, almost gone in this one. OK, so neural networks, uh, they work very well. Uh, very, people are very happy about it. But people who are actually trying to use these neural networks in industry, they're also worried. And the reason is that um, sometimes you can find, well, actually not sometimes, if you take an image and you find close to that image a, an, 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 another image, which looks the same but is still a little bit changed, um, you can make, it, make the algorithm completely say the wrong, make the wrong prediction. So you can, you can make this, for this particular input and this one and this one, the algorithm said ostrich, which is terrible, clearly. But it was, it was manufactured to do bad on that particular example. And in general, on average, it does very well. But this, this, you, you can manufacture these examples where it does bad. And these ones are actually also manufactured to do bad, but even very confidently. So it says, like, with 99.6% ac uh, you know, accuracy of, uh, of uh, confidence, it says that this is a king penguin, which clearly it isn't. Right? So there's still things we need to understand better about these deep learning algorithms, and um, we're working on it. One thing we can do is do uncertainty quantification better, um, which basically means that we want these algorithms to know when they don't know. Right? So if you're uh, in a car right, and an algorithm that 
understands that it's not that it doesn't know can say you grab the steering wheel an algorithm that's very confidently making the wrong pre uh, prediction will drive you into a tree so one way to do that is also to visualize what the what the algorithm is thinking when it makes a prediction so here we have uh, an input a penguin and here's our new method that basically the red pl you know places um, are the parts of the image that it uses to classify this image as being a penguin and that's clearly the sort of the breast region which is very distinguished distinguishable for a penguin um, the blue region is evidence against it because that head actually looks like another bird also um, now this is of course very useful for instance when you do brain MRI imaging when you say you want to predict whether a patient has Alzheimer you can uh, visualize those regions which the algorithm uses to make the prediction that this particular patient is likely to have Alzheimer in the future right and then the doctor can go in and study that region better and say yeah that's actually different from a normal patient now another cool application area of deep learning is that you can actually generate text that belongs to an image automatically so you analyze the image and then there is an algorithm based on deep learning that generates a group of people shopping at an outdoor market uh, and uh, there are many vegetables at the fruit stand right and that's all done completely automatically it's quite impressive right a baseball player is throwing a ball in a game a woman's holding a bunch of bananas a black cat sitting on top of a suitcase all these things look pretty good and then we have a woman holding a teddy bear in front of a mirror so again this is an example another one of these examples where you know the algorithm does pretty good but then in certain cases it, do, it does ridiculously bad at least in our view and perception of the world so we can still improve on these things and I think you know we can understand that this might also help with uh, you know analyzing CVs as the CVs actually do have images in them we can we can create some text surrounding that image so the second um, application area is causality um, so this is a di different field now I've now I've now talked about deep learning now the next one is going to be causality and uh, why is this important um, well let me give you another example I already give you the example of the black cars versus uh, you know other colored cars but there's a very interesting example that people for a long time thought that children which were born with mental disabilities that it might be due to uh, to a difficult birth process so they found a lot of examples where children which went through a difficult birth process difficult labor um, developed mental disabilities and they all they thought that the difficult birth process maybe because of oxygen shortage or something was was actually causing the disability but it turned out that the other way was more true which is that a, 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 the brain of a child and the brain of a mother will have to very closely coordinate in order for this birth process to happen and so actually the mental disabilities were causing the, the difficult birth process and so it's really difficult to distinguish these two by just looking at the data and traditionally people have distinguish these two by what's called an intervention by fixing something you know half of the population gets the blue pill the other half of the population gets the red pill right and you know we see which of the two you know get better sooner or something like that um, but that's not always possible and it's also not always ethical to do these things right um, and so there's a new branch of machine learning that studies these observational data without interventions and tries to derive these uh, these causal relationships and they're very important because once you have the causal relationships your predictions become a lot more stable if you change your environment a little bit so if you study you know resumes in one country and you, you, you build a beautiful predictor then um, when you do it in another country you want this predictor still to be working well and if you have causal relationships in your model that's a lot better now where can this be helpful uh, this could be really helpful for predictive maintenance uh, for instance uh, you know if you're an airplane an airline um, and you want to make sure that your um, that your uh, engines don't go out in the middle of the air so you want to be able to predict before it actually happens that something is going wrong and then if it goes wrong you want to figure out which part of the uh, you know the things that you're measuring are actually causing you know the the, um, the failure which means you can fix that part now the third one I want to talk about um, is um, reinforcement learning and I think this one is particularly important for you know for people who do text and search because if I search on the internet um, I'm interacting with my search engine 
I'm not just observing the world, I'm interacting. As a search engine, I'm interacting with my environment. And how do, how do I learn from that? Well, uh, if I'm a mouse and I'm running in a, in a uh, maze, I need to find the cheese, right? Um, I'm only getting the reward very late. I'm just making all these decisions of going left and right, and then at some point I get the cheese. And somehow that reward signal will have to learn me how to navigate that maze. So um, I have actions, which is going left or right. I make observations about the world, and I get rewards when I actually get the cheese. OK. Um, so this, uh, as I said, is very important for recommender systems. So if I want to recommend you know, uh, people to jobs or match people to jobs, this could be an in interesting uh, application. Uh, the most well-known recommender system is from Netflix. Netflix uh, recommends us movies, and we give feedback uh, by starring them, right? A five is a really good movie, and a one is a very bad movie. And uh, Netflix also observes us because they're checking whether you actually finished the movie, yes or no, or maybe you stop halfway through. I think I'm out of time because it is <laughs> not moving anymore. Ah, there it is. So the last uh, topic within the time that I have that I'm going to briefly talk about is privacy. And this is actually very close to my heart. And the reason is that I see a future where there's all this data available and more and more things can be done, but people get increasingly uneasy about the fact that all these algorithms learn about us personally. They know where we are every minute of the day. And if this information is in the hands of a few big companies we, or, or a maleficent uh, a government, then we should be really careful, right? So how can we still analyze all that data in such a way that the privacy of every individual is actually maintained. And um, I'm going to skip this particular example, which tells me some, which explains how you should not actually do anonymization. Um, talk to me later if you want to. Um, but I want to say that there's this solution now. It's called differential privacy. And it's this woman, Cynthia Dwork, who has been driving that research forward. And the idea is that you ask a question uh, you know, to a database, and the database will respond to you, but it will not give the, the precise answer to your question. It will add a bit of noise or randomness to that answer. Right? And it will do so in such a way that it is guaranteed that you will not learn anything or tiny little bit about any individual in the data set beyond what is already known in the world out there. And so there's very tight um, guarantees on this, and I think this has a beautiful future. Um, I have a few examples that I'm sort of going to skip over real fast because I have maybe one minute left. Uh, deep learning is making a big impact in transportation. As we all know, self-driving cars are going to be with us within five or ten years. Um, and machine learning is very important there. Expert systems are going to be super important, I think. You know, uh, even at a level that we couldn't imagine before, which are sort of brain jobs, like uh, doctors and lawyers, maybe professors at some point in the future as well. And we have seen something like this when IBM Watson uh, you know, played Jeopardy. Right? It's basically having the information of the entire internet at its disposal and using it in an intelligent way. So these kind of systems are going to be super important um, and are gonna, uh, I'm going to start replacing jobs at some point. OK, I'll skip this. Um, I'll just uh, you know, stop here since uh, the chair is uh, standing up, which is a bad sign for me. Um, so I just want to say that, um, yes, machine learning is on a roller coaster. Things are going very fast. And there's beautiful applications of this which could make the world a better place. But there's also applications which could make the world a worse place. And we have to have a conversation about this, whether we want this. This one, for instance, I don't like very much. It's called faceception, and they're trying to profile people by just a picture on the web um, into whether you're a terrorist or not. Well, if you're looking Middle Eastern, you should be worried about that, because I don't think you can do much beyond you know, things like, do you look Middle Eastern, yes or not? But it turns out that um, security agencies are already using this technology. They already bought it, apparently. So let's have a conversation. Autonomous weapons. Weapons that decide themselves, you know, we have, to, we have to have the conversation. Smart cities, you know, tracking everybody at an individual level. If that data falls in the wrong hands, we have to have that conversation. So I want to just uh, say, you know, let's use data and AI responsibly. Thank you very much. Um, 
Thank you very much for your, for your talk, Max. Uh, is there anybody in the room who has a specific question for Max on his, uh, on his talk? Yep, over here, Federico. Yes, could you say a couple more words about the, the last to previous slide, the one about anonymity or using the data without knowing specifically the person more than what's already available on the web? Yeah, um, it's a long and somewhat mathematical story. Um, but the idea is that, uh, so, so my vision of this is that you have your data sitting in silos, let's say hospitals, so ho we are looking at patient records, the data is sitting in these, in these silos, um, and now we want to build a model, basically we want to predict uh, skin cancer from a picture of a skin. So then we want, in, in, if we want to train our model, we send a query to a database, and we say, can I please have this uh, update for my model? I want to change my model, I want to improve my model. And then the hospital will uh, compute the sensitivity of that request. They will say, how much can this particular person learn by the answer that I'm going to give to that, to that question? And if it's very sensitive for individuals, it will add noise in such a way that all that sensitivity you know, to reveal information about individuals is going to be removed. And then it will give you the answer. So, um, and in the end, you can guarantee that you will only learn a tiny little bit about any individual in the data set beyond what is already known. Okay, thank you. One more question for Max here yeah, in the back. Hi, uh, I'm from TextKernel, and uh, I'd like to ask, in general in the area of artificial intelligence in the past decades, there were always the, the battle between top-down approaches, knowledge engineering, data engineering, versus machine learning. Now with deep learning, it seems that machine learning gets a lot uh, better. What would, you see, what would you say is the relation now between top-down approaches, you know, traditional data engineering, knowledge engineering, with deep learning? Really interesting question. Actually, I've done a research on this. Um, so it's true that one I would, you could call data-driven and the other one you could call model-driven. The good thing about model-driven approaches is that you can understand and interpret your model. Every variable means something. One variable could be causally related to another model. So for some, that's really important. The other one is like more like a black box. But you can actually combine them beautifully. You can have a generative model or this sort of top-down model that sort of expresses and incorporates expert knowledge because it's so interpretable, you can build this model and inject all of your expert knowledge in that model. And then the, the bottom-up model, which is your deep neural net or your machine learning approach, whatever you call it, is trying to invert this generative model and it gets regularized or gets, you know, sort of, uh, you know, get, gets, um, you know, the, the, the generative model is, uh, is helping you build a better you know, d data driven model. So these two can tightly interact with each other. And this is actually a very interesting uh, field of research, I believe. Okay, well, thank you for answering the questions, Max. Uh, will you be around at the conference for a little bit more time for people? Uh, yes, maybe to a ask little questions? bit. Yes. Okay, we'll, see. well, thank you for your contribution. Thank you so much.